Answer the question. Diplomats and politicians do that. Yeah, it's an old trick. Do we have to press the button on this? Do you have enough room here or no, am I? Is it on? Is the red light? Doesn't work. This this is not the button. Okay, no. But do you have the red light? Not working. Oh yeah. My printer's not working at home, so I had to bring this. Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Literary Translation Centre at the London Book Fair. Uh, it's, it's fine. Um, my name is Daniel Hahn, and I'm very pleased to have been asked to chair this afternoon's session on translating from the Baltics. As you know, the Baltic states are uh, jointly a market focused countries of um, the. Sorry, just hang on one moment. It's, it's, it's okay. It's on. It's like microphone conversation. Um, Latvia, Lithuania and Estonia are jointly the market focus of the London Book Fair this year. So we're having lots of opportunities to examine and to celebrate some of the great writing that's coming from those three countries. And of course, one of the things that means is thinking about the ways in which the, that, that literature travels. It means talking about translation and the process of getting literature into and out of those three countries and into and out of the English-speaking world. So I'm delighted to be chairing a panel which is called... Uh, revealed or lost in translation, literature from the Baltics. And we have these four very distinguished speakers who are going to be talking to us about this subject. At the far end, it's quite a large panel. All the way over there uh, is Romas Kinka, who translates from Lithuanian to English. To his left is Carlos Verdant, who uh, is a writer and a translator from Latvia, translates into Latvian. Um, his poetry is published here by ARC. Um, to to Carlos's left is Christopher Mosley, who translates into English from Estonian and Latvian. And to my immediate right, uh, Maria Kangra, who is a writer and translator from Estonia, who writes in Estonian but translates from... She is translated from... I'm going to get this right now. Italian, German, English and Russian. It's alarming, isn't it? Yes. You get a round of applause just for that. Um, I, I, feel like, I feel like we've already won now. Good, we can go now. Um, I'm just going to start by... We'll do a kind of scene-setting conversation briefly. I want to ask, maybe, Chris, I'll ask you first, um, how you come to have the languages you translate from. Do you translate from Estonian and Latvian? Where, where do they come from for you? Uh, by a gradual sliding process, really. Uh, my, in my s interests uh, in languages, um, which started in Scandinavia and slid eastward through Finland and... Then I started visiting the Baltic countries and fell in love with them, and um, um, particularly through um, uh, Estonian and Latvian, which I, I had an actual, I found a, an excuse to, to learn them better by uh, writing a thesis about the only, the only language that those two languages have in common between them, which was Livonian. I wrote an academic thesis about the dying Livonian language many years ago. So, I couldn't get by without finding sources in Estonian and, and Latvian. But then I came to their literatures and discovered what a treasure house they are. And um, um, it went from there, really. Thank you. I'm going to ask you a little bit later about, about that discovery of the literature, because one of the things I want to talk about is the role of the translator in, in discovering the literature as well as in translating the literature. Yeah. But let me ask Romas, let me ask you that same question about th these the two languages that you work in. How do you come to have this relationship? Well, I am a Lithuanian. I was born in Lithuania during the war. I left at the age of two, spent four years in Germany. Uh, by the time I was six, I was trilingual, and I mean trilingual. That is, I spoke Lithuanian, German, and English fluently, without even trying. So I think I'm quite lucky in that respect. And as far as discovering Lithuanian literature, well, I didn't have to discover it because basically, I had it forced down my throat by my mother because my mother insisted that every day after nursery or kindergarten in, in Germany, I would spend an hour after school uh, studying Lithuanian in one way or another, you know, reading Lithuanian being given texts, having to explain the text back to my mother. And then when I came to England, my mother hired a public school English teacher 
to improve my English. So basically, I was fed those three languages. Well, German as well, of course, because my mother insisted I keep up my German. She said, one day it might be useful to you. Well, it hasn't really, although I've traveled widely through Germany. And at one point, I used to teach Lithuanian at a gymnasium close to Hüttenfeld every summer in Germany. So obviously, German helped there as well, because I was teaching uh, Lithuanian Germans or children who spoke either very poor Lithuanian or no Lithuanian. So I taught different kinds of classes. Right. So all of that helped. So, so we blame your mother, basically. It's all uh, your mother's yes, fault. Yes, absolutely. The whole thing. I, I go down on my knees almost every day and I thank my mother and my father, who died very early, unfortunately. But my mother certainly was an abiding influence. And I'm grateful to her. I'm interested and I'm very jealous because I have... Uh, I translate from three languages, two of which are my parents' languages, Portuguese and Spanish, mm. but actually I never spoke those with them. And I've, had, I've been blaming my parents for not introducing me to languages. So I'm well, there you go. Very, I'm very simply jealous. lucky. That's it. It's luck, pure luck. Carlos, what about you? Carlos, you, because you work, I said you work as a translator as well as as a writer. So how do you come to have this kind of relationship with languages as well as your, your writing language? Yeah. Uh, I've been studying English since I was like 10, but uh, probably I didn't, not, didn't do it so too hard. But yeah, the, the good thing with translating poetry is that you don't have to be really always perfect in that language. You just need to know what this poem really about. And you can, uh, you can collaborate with somebody whose uh, language skills are better I have translated from Czech as well, but just because I had that uh, girl who was really fluent in Czech. But you have a fluency in poetry. Yeah. Which is, which is the, your, your working language as well. Yeah. And Maria, finally you. I said at the beginning that you have, you have translated from a range of different languages. So presumably you have, you have different relationships with each of these languages that you bring into uh, Estonia. Yeah, certainly. Uh, well, uh, first, uh, I will say something very high flown. Uh, uh, language is always meant power to me, and the, uh, uh, they meant an access to things, access to the world. And uh, uh, so, uh, at a very early age, I was drawn to uh, translating uh, things even from the languages that I didn't know about. Uh, I, I would I either find out the, uh, the meaning from a dictionary or ask my parents. And uh, well, first, uh, you mentioned your mother. So um, you know, I could also say that the, uh, my first contact with the Italian language uh, actually, uh, well, uh, uh, comes from my mother. When uh, I was nine years old, uh, my mother got the chance to attend the uh, book fair in uh, Bologna. And uh, for that, she started to learn Italian. And I got hold of uh, her Italian-Russian textbook. So I was uh, avidly reading that. Of course, it was full of ideological stuff and about the, uh, a certain Anna or Paola belonging to the co Italian Communist Party and <laughs> so on and so forth. But still, the language was there, and it was very interesting. By that age, I, I had already uh, well learned some Russian at school because I belonged to that generation. Although I know that the, I'm on, on the border of generations, uh, there are people of my age who, who don't speak any Russian anymore, but I was, I was always interested the, also in, uh, in the Russian language. And, the, and I watched the, uh, the Russian TV because uh, late at night sometimes uh, there was nothing else to watch when the Finnish TV was over, was done with the programs, so uh, there was only the Russian TV left. And again, yeah, we, uh, you had to know what these Russians were talking about, so it was important to, uh, to master the language as well. And then uh, later on, uh, of course, I forgot uh, about the, uh, the Italian language and then it uh, took me uh, 15 years or 14 years to find an uh, Italian guy. And that was, uh, he was the, uh, the main reason actually uh, why I started, uh, started to well, be uh, working more on that language and, and then uh, avidly reading everything I, I, uh, I could in Italian. And then, of course, it's uh, through a person, a specific person. It's, uh, I think, the uh, the easiest way to uh, to uh, get an access 
to the language Sorry, and culture. And then, can, you, uh, can you say something about, about the, the opposite of that as well? Because you said something about, you, you've talked about language as a way of getting access. But I wonder whether you could kind of turn that around and talk about also your own work, how that has been translated out. Because it's also, for a reader, it's how you access other writers. But for a writer, it's also how you reach r readers outside your language translation. Oh, yeah, sure, of course, yeah, but I, uh, in this, yeah, well, it's, yeah, it's a difficult thing for the, uh, the speakers of small languages, although, like, uh, in global terms, Estonian or Latvian or Lithuanian are not that small languages after all, but anyway, uh, we are not in the center of this, uh, well, the uh, World Republic of Letters, as Pascal Casanova, the, uh, the, the French uh, literary scholar, would call it. So it's, uh, it's a very important uh, yeah, means of access to the world. And, uh, well, the, the, as Casanova, again, the, uh, puts it, the, uh, the translation is, uh, is the main uh, prize and weapon in the international competition. The, uh, uh, yeah, in, 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 the, in the field of literature, and the, uh, well, I, I never I, uh, wanted to translate myself. I wouldn't be able to do so. So I have to trust the translators, and uh, you're really lucky if you find somebody who's uh, like uh, with whom you feel that you are on the same wavelength, or uh, you have some kind of a mental affinity. Like, uh, for example, I was really very happy when I read the translation of a short story of mine by Chris. I, I could feel that uh, Chris has got the same sensibility or he, he has got the, uh, the irony, uh, the, the, the sarcasm that was there in the story. And uh, it is not always the case, you know. Mm. And, um, Chris, is that something which you find that, that one of the issues you have when you're translating it, there's a, there's a particular, Maria used the word affinity, where there's a particular kind of connection you're trying to make, which uh, is going to be different depending well, on your writer. I, I want to believe that, and I'm very flattered to hear that from Maria. I would say that I was simply trying to be the servant of her ideas, but um, the, um, the, um, it's more than just ideas, and I, I think Maria is onto something there because um, I, I, I can't speak for the irony and sarcasm. There, there is irony and sarcasm in her work. And uh, I'm, I'm also concerned with the cadences of speech and the, and the dialogue that it's represented. And um, uh, the, the rhythms of Estonian speech are very different to the rhythms of, of, of English speech. And you could, you could say the same about the translation of of poetry um, uh, from from Latvian as well. I'm I'm not responsible for translating uh, Carlis' Latvian poetry, but uh, I'm very struck by the faithfulness of your translator to your rhythms. Um, and I I hope that I that e e even with with prose, I've been I've been able to um, to to follow that the rhythm of speech as well as close as I can. Because that's part of the of the atmosphere of the story, in the in the case of the story you're talking about. One thing, Romas, which which what Chris said is suggesting is that following writer by writer or story by story means we're looking for different things. It means that every writer has particular challenges, particular voices, particular things that you're trying to, to tap into. It's very striking that you are. I think you said you are. There are three uh, Lithuanian translators who are part of the part of the program at the fair here, and you, in fact, are the translator of all of them. Um, very conveniently. Yeah, um, well, Daniel, so we uh, my life is basically one long piece of dumb luck. Dumb luck. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know whether you know the Horace Walpole story about two princes that go out for a walk, and the term he uses is serendipity. Serendipity. If you're not familiar with the word, look it up. You know the word? Serendipity? Yeah. Right. So it's the way it is for me. I don't actually go out and look for anything. I go out for a walk, and all of a sudden something happens. So what happened was, about six years ago, 
I was approached by the Lithuanian Cultural Institute, although it had a different name than it was Books from Lithuania. And they said, would you like to translate a sample for us of something? And I was very offended. I thought, what, they want to see how good my work is? And I thought, well, the hell with it. They said, no, no, no. We just want simply at you to translate a text, an extract that we've chosen. So they've come back to me time and time again. So by pure dumb luck, I happen to be the translator <laughs> of all three Lithuanian authors officially taking part in this fair. I don't do poetry, so not Thomas Wenzlova, but all three. And it was, it's interesting, actually, because I've done all three over the last two years, and each one brings different challenges. So can you say just very briefly, just yeah. a couple of lines about each of them? Because when, when Chris was talking about yeah. try, trying to kind of tap Absolutely. into that voice, well, just I'll say a little bit about each of those. Alva Schlipikas, the author I'm translating now, he's just re he's re he wrote a novel several years ago. He's already been translated into seven languages, but not into Lithuanian yet. So I'm doing that. It'll come out at the beginning of next year. So his language has everything. There's poetry, there's slang, there's swear words. I can give you one little example, which I'll choose now. Uh, and, uh, oh, by the way, besides the fact that I speak English, uh, I think you can all hear that I, I, I have no problem speaking in English. It's, it's very convincing, your English. I'd say. Thank you. I try really hard. Right. But I also have a native control, believe it or not, of what's called the London popular dialect, which is Cockney. Not, not a lie, because I came into England at the age of six, spent two years in Wiltshire, and then we moved to London into the East End. So I walked out into the street and I started speaking the English I'm speaking now, and basically I had a, about seven uh, boys attacking me, thinking I, mean, I was going to swear. Do you mind if I swear? Oh, you're all that also. I thought, what the fuck? You know, what, what sort of language is that? What sort of language is that? So basically, within three days, I was speaking Cockney like anyone else. Nobody would know the difference, but I kept them s completely apart. I didn't modify one in the direction of the other. Normally, EastEnders, what they do, when they, for example, go to school, it's ironed out of them. So they learn to speak basically a modified kind of Cockney or standard English of some kind. If people call it BBC English, whatever you want. So, I translated this excerpt from Alves' novel, and it's, it's uh, about the German wolf children who become homeless, are orphans, at the end of the war. The Russians occupy what was East Prussia. It's now, of course, called Kaliningrad, or the Kaliningrad region. Now, these boys are crossing, or rather children, are crossing a bridge it, across a river into Lithuania, and there are two guards. There's an Asian, who's singing, and there's a Russian, and the Russian is completely fed up with this singing Asian. So he says to the Russian, who can't stand, he said, the Russian can't stand it any longer, he said, fuck it, shut your gob, you tow rag. Now that's completely cockney, and I think it works. So it's mm. dialect. The Asian smiles, he is quiet for a while, and then says softly, tow rag, tow rag, you're the tow rag. The wind is whistling, the motherland is farther, far away. That is the Russian motherland. The roll-up, uh, the, the Russian is trying to ro do a roll-up in the wind. There's a heavy wind. The match breaks in the soldier's calloused hands. The Asian laughs. And he says to the Russian, hey, Ivan. And the Russian says, my name's not Ivan, it's Yevgeny. They call me Zhenya. I mean, the Asian couldn't care less. He couldn't give a fuck, as we say in English. <laughs> so. The Asian is trying to rile up the Russian. He yeah. says, look, Ivan, the little Germans are running. They're running across the ice of the river trying to get into Lithuania because that's the border. The German children are running on the ice like partridges. A couple of the smaller children lag behind. The Russian shoulder, uh, soldier shouts out, stop, go back, go back. That's an order. Stop, you fascist pigs. These are children, children, right? But the bridge is high up. The wind masks the guard's voice and they run on. They see a person on the bridge waving his ha arms about, but they can't understand the soldier's language. Because, of course, the Russian is speaking in Russian and the children only know German. So the Asian says, hey, Ivan. So the Russian says, my name's not Ivan, you tow rag. And I'll finish here. So the Asian says, they're telling you to suck their dicks, Ivan. I'm going to kill you, says the Russian to, to the Asian. 
And the agent says very calmly, calm down, you fucking idiot. Hmm. So that's the little... So I think that works quite well hmm. in English. It does. What's interesting there, and actually Carlos wanted to ask you about poetry in a second, because what's, one of the things that's interesting is mostly what you're talking about, what Ramos was talking about is you, talk, so you said briefly that... The, the characteristics of the original are such. It has these, this range yeah. of things. But actually, mostly what you're talking about is how you're using your own language Absolutely. and your relationship Absolutely. to your own language. And I'm interested, Carlos, with you, because you write your own, you're a poet, as well as a, as a translator of poetry, whether you can say something about the relationship of, of your writing and, your, and, and the translating and how those things... Because, of course, when you're translating poetry, you are still a poet yourself. And so your own use of your own language becomes yeah. very important. I think the I think the worst thing that uh, anybody can say to a translator of poetry is that your translations sound like your own poems. Uh, this is something I I wouldn't wouldn't like to hear, but still sometimes somebody would say that to me and I get extremely offended. <laughs> but I mean, I just want these poems to, say, to sound nice, so what should I do? I just do my best. And uh, yeah, I think it's uh, like a problem that uh, if, I, if I try to make my Latvian translation like lively and witty and like I would use some, some, something like very contemporary language then uh, yeah, they might sound as my own poems. My last translation was uh, selected poems by Emily Dickinson, and I was extremely happy when people said, "No, th this doesn't uh, sound like your own poems." But there must, even if you're not, you don't want Emily Dickinson to sound like you, because of course this is a weird thing. There must be some relationship still, because your, I mean, th th your writing must be influenced by your translating. There must be some kind of some kind of contact between these things. Not because they sound the same, but because the, the influence of the way you use, the kind of choices you make, all those things, you can't stop being you just because you are pretending to be Emily Dickinson. Yeah, but well, sorry for interfering, Please. but I think even the worst thing to say to a translator would be uh, yeah, that, oh, this poem sounds exactly like a translated poem. So I think yeah, if a translation sounds like a translation, it's, it's a bad thing. I think mm. I, I wouldn't take it as a compliment. <laughs> I think the, uh, if it sounds like your own poetry, it's, it's not as bad as that. Do you have that sense, Mario, when you're both translating and writing, that there is any kind of... that, that there's a kind of very hard barrier between the things you're writing in Estonian and the things that you are bringing from other writers? Or is there a little bit of sort of porousness between them? Uh, uh, I think he, uh, the, the, well, the, my translations have uh, had a big impact on what I'm writing or the, the authors. First of all, of course, the, uh, if we are talking about uh, translating poetry, then this is something uh, that uh, you do out of your own free will because uh, poetry. Uh, is usually, and especially translated poetry, uh, it's not something that would have a big market, so uh, there is no commission for it. So you can uh, pick your poets yourself. Usually uh, you depend uh, on, on the grants uh, of different states or uh, of your own country, uh, but uh, nobody's counting on, on, uh, on their market value, actually. Right. And so this is, uh, uh, first of all, a matter of, of this uh, fine, uh, being soulmates with somebody. So you already pick out authors or poets uh, because you feel that the, there is the, uh, some kind of, well, you know, you know, the same wavelength again or, or you, know, you are somehow synchronous uh, mentally with these uh, poets. And the, uh, uh, then again, of course, the, uh, uh, they give you uh, uh, lots of new material and new ways of uh, uh, using images, using language, uh, uh, playing with grammar, also uh, well the uh, new attitudes or the ways of dealing with language, dealing with the, with the world. So uh, I think I, I also uh, started as a poet uh, who was very much influenced by the contemporary Italian poetry uh, first, the uh, famous poet like Andrea Zanzotto, for example, but also others like Valerio Magrelli, who's uh, much more accessible 
he, uh, in his texts and in his thinking and in his expression. And also the uh, Neo Avanguardia, the, uh, the new uh, avant-garde of Italy. But of course, uh, this also made me uh, a, a kind of a hermetic poet, too hermetic for Estonia at that time. So uh, in, in interaction with my audience, I, I kind of change in the course of time. One of the things, Chris, one of the things that, that Mario said a moment ago to do with, in some ways, the difficulty of getting things in, in this case, poetry, is to do with things like funding and to do with actually just not being able to rely on the market. And I wonder if you could say something about your experience. What are the challenges of translating, particularly from these languages, the languages you work from, which may be to do with markets and maybe to do with money and maybe to do with language as well. What are the, what are the, the things that are distinctively difficult? Because well, we know I'm translation is always difficult. Uh, but I'm sure that both, both of the authors on either side of me are, are well aware of how difficult it is to get um, into the English language market. And um, I, uh, I'm aware of a certain responsibility in, in, in doing my best to, to get um, writers noticed from the Baltic countries to do my little bit towards it. Now, um, is that part of, sorry to interrupt you, is that part of your job as a translator also then? Well, as Mario was saying, you know, actually choosing poets that she feels a connection to. Yeah. So it's part of your job also sort of selecting what makes it in? Uh, no, I would say that that job is done for me because both, both um, Latvia and Estonia have well organized um, uh, state funded uh, liter literary agencies. Yeah and I usually uh, act on their guidance. But there have been times in the past when I've tried to promote an author myself uh, and sent samples of their work to publishers. Uh, and, um, uh, but usually it's on the prompting of either the Latvian or the Estonian literary agencies. And I'm, I'm glad that it works that way. But of course, uh, from literature from a small country like any of the Baltic countries relies on state subsidies. So in other words, the, the publisher of the translated version is going to have to, um, to have, get the incentive, have the incentive of some, some funding from that state body. So, um, otherwise, they, won't, they simply won't take it on. Yeah. And um, that is a hard fact of life. Um, and one that I, I guess when I, I tried to ignore that fact when I was first embarking on uh, literary translation, but you can't ignore it. But it's as you said, that there are there are very well organised yeah. state funding bodies from Estonia and Latvia, and this is certainly true about Lithuania as well. That the promotional organisations behind these yeah. countries' literature is very strong. And I wonder, Romas, whether you felt the same, whether you, your experience is similar to Chris, and that mostly the work is coming from somewhere else, and you do it. So your job isn't to scout and promote. Your job is to do the translation. Everything comes machine. to me. <laughs> I don't go to anything. <laughs> it's as simple as that. I turn so, your, so your job is, the, translate, the work comes in, you translate it, it goes out, and then you, it's someone else's problem. Well, it's not a problem. I mean, I'm grateful <laughs> for being offered work. I turn a lot of work away. I, for example, I don't do science fiction, although there is excellent science fiction, of course. Uh, I don't do romance. <laughs> I wouldn't do a Boone and Mills romance, for example. I mean, that, that's unthinkable. I translate what, what is high quality literary fiction. I mean, literary fiction. I mean, I don't think we need the other words, do we? Just literary fiction. Uh, no. And, and I, by the way, the way I come to something is I'm offered something. And what I do then is I take the book to bed. <laughs> My wife isn't here, so I'll just say, like a lover, right? <laughs> and if we get on <laughs> after a night or two or three, you commit to a few months together. That's it. Yes. Yeah. That's precisely it. That's how it works for me. Catalyst, yeah. um, we were just talking about the, the, the kind of the profession of the translator. So doing the translating, but also whether our job is to find the books and choose the books and also have a kind of bigger role rather than just being responsive. And I wonder if you can say something about what the, how the profession works in Latvia. Obviously, translating poetry is always going to be Translating poetry everywhere is different from translating anything else, as far as I know. But do you have a sense of, of whether the profession of translation, uh, literary translation in Latvia is, um, is a sort of responsive one where the, the work comes and you do it, or whether the translators are part of that process of selecting how literature travels and which literature, which books move? 
What's the, the state of that profession now? Uh, the great thing about being uh, Latvian is that uh, whatever you want to do, you might be the first one ever doing this. For example, that uh, this uh, Dickinson's book was uh, the first her uh, collection in Latvian ever. Uh, she has her collections already in Estonian and in Lithuanian, but well, not not, uh, not not in Latvian. And there are a lot of very great authors uh, which uh, have never been translated into Latvian still. And yeah, we are together with uh, my my translator and colleague Eva Lashinska, we are translating T.S. Eliot into Latvian for some 20 years already, but uh, she, 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 she longer than me. But yeah, I don't know. I hope we will be still alive when the book comes out. <laughs> there is a question both in this country and in every country, I suppose, about who are the kind of people that decide which are the books that get translated? Because obviously, whether it's a publisher, whether it's a funder, there are decisions which are made and those are political or they're economic, they're to do with cultural policy and diplomacy. There are all kinds of, all kind of factors that go into deciding that book A is translated rather than, rather than book B. And there is something you mentioned in an email the other day, Carlos, about a time when uh, the translation in Soviet times between the Soviet republics the fact of these things being translated between these countries, that becomes a, it became a sort of political thing, it became a kind of political act, yeah. conveying literature across these, these countries. Uh, yeah, in the Soviet times, the Russian language was our lingua franca, and normally the process would be that an Estonian poet would have his or her rough translations in Russia, and then somebody in Latvia would translate them from Russian, of course, with many mistakes and uh, losing very much of the original appeal, but uh, that's the, that was the way how it was supposed to be. Uh, but uh, Latvian poets were very eager to learn uh, languages, especially small languages, and to have this uh, direct way of translating instead of just relying on uh, these Russian uh, rough translate, translations, so uh, they, they didn't translate Emily Dickinson just because they had to translate some Buryat or Bashkirian or <laughs> Uzbekistan poets, you know, and that was considered to be much more important than to translate all these Western classics. Is that then, when if, if we assume that there is, there is a particular uh, significance of whatever kind given to the things that are chosen to translate, because we will translate this and we won't translate this. I wonder whether, Maria, that means that, that there is a certain kind of pressure on you as a writer, um, and i sorry to put you under this pressure, but <laughs> here you are and you can't leave now, whether, you know, when you are one of not very many Estonian writers who are translated in English, for example, whether, that, whether there is an expectation, whether you are supposed to represent something, I mean, it, it's a very uncomfortable thing when, when it's... We oh. don't have, unfortunately, yet, I hope this will change, but we don't have hundreds and hundreds of Estonian writers, all of them flooding the English market. Yeah, well, and so uh, you're in an, an interesting well, position. Sorry, but I must correct you. I have no book in English. No, but you have well, stories. My, my, you have my poems and short stories have appeared yeah. in, in several uh, magazines or yeah, yeah. Uh, anthologies, but uh, I don't have a book yet. But I think uh, there are many factors uh, uh, yeah, on which uh, this process uh, or this decision to translate somebody uh, depends. First of all, of course, it's, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's important to find a publisher. That's the main thing. Somebody has to publish it. Uh, but then they, uh, we also have this uh, Estonian Literature Information Center, who is the, uh, the, uh, sometimes putting together anthologies or uh, also yeah, like sending people to events like, uh, like London Book Fair, for example. And uh, they uh, then pick the authors uh, who uh, they think uh, could be uh, the, uh, well, in some respect, the uh, representative of, uh, of some important phenomena in the Estonian uh, literary field. And then, of course, uh, that, it's sorry the translators. To sorry to interrupt, yeah. but that thing about somehow representing 
Yeah, that's, yeah, maybe it's well, a strange it's way like of thinking that. about a national literature. Oh, yeah, isn't it, it is. Uh, yeah, actually, uh, I would say that the uh, well, the, uh, for for a writer uh, from a, a big, a, uh, well, a speaker of, of, of a, a writer in a big language, uh, it would be very strange if somebody addressed him or her. Uh, do you feel that you are representing France? Do you feel uh, that you're representing Britain? I mean, uh, who would ask Julian Barnes or even Michel Houellebecq, something like that? It right. would be like, well, why, why should I be a national representative here? But, uh, well, uh, for our focus, the authors of the focus market, it somehow happens to be like that because we are not, again, using the, uh, the, uh, the words of uh, Pascal Casanova, whom I like very much, obviously. Yeah. Uh, we are, do not belong to this Greenish meridian of, uh, of the World Republic of Letters. Uh, uh, and uh, somehow in this big uh, international li literary field, uh, we are not in the center. Uh, we shouldn't feel like that. And I think uh, uh, this is not the way uh, a writer in, in Estonia or Lithuania or Latvia s should ever think. Uh, it's like uh, we are doing our own things and then we really shouldn't, uh, well, the hell with these translations. But still, it is an important thing. Uh, well, you, you can't help you. You want to uh, 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 communicate uh, whatever message you have got. And so this is why these, uh, uh, well, the, the ushers of the literary world are so important. This is uh, why the publishers are so important and the translators, of course. Because uh, it's, I think in many cases, it's also the translator who says or uh, that, OK, this is a, an author that I like or a, I will propose this author to a publisher that I know. And this is why the uh, authors and poets sometimes carry favor with the translators. They uh, do whatever they can. They, they try to flatter them. Uh, they try to make themselves attractive as authors. And it's, uh, yeah, well, we, I hope I never did that. But yeah, you never know. Yeah. Can I just add something to that? Um, uh, I think we're coming, uh, he, here we are celebrating 100 years since the first declaration of independence by the Baltic countries. Of course, there had to be a... Hmm? I have to say this, I'm sorry, I've heard this already five times today. Lithuania was an independent country in the Middle Ages, oh, yeah. unlike Estonia and Latvia. Yeah, thank so you. I'm very sorry. Yes, yeah. the, okay. the Republic. The, the Republic. The, the first <laughs> first yeah. Republics, yeah. Yes, you're right. I should have known this was going to happen. Um, uh, but of course, there has been a long period of Soviet occupation inter intervening. So if we imagine ourselves 100 years ago at an imaginary London book fair um, in 1918, when these countries were newly independent, we might have been uh, asking what kind of cultural baggage uh, from, foreign from foreign cultures they were carrying then. It's, t it's a totally different situation to the one where uh, we're now uh, experiencing a whole generation has grown up since the second, the, the, the most recent declaration of independence. Uh, and uh, we no longer think, we, we English speaking readers, we foreign readers, no longer have to think of uh, Baltic literature as a sub-branch of Soviet literature. But if, if if we were in that imaginary situation a hundred years ago, um, certainly in the case of Estonia, and I think of Latvia too, the, the cultural baggage uh, would have been German cultural baggage. Um, very strong, a very strong influence of, of German, which we no longer have to consider as topical today. Uh, and I don't think, I think uh, Baltic literatures have now reached a maturity where they no longer have to um, we assume that outsiders think they're just sub-Soviets. Yeah, I think yeah. Yeah, this is what I think uh, as well, that we, we shouldn't uh, only try to sell ourselves as the, uh, uh, yeah, with the legacy of the Soviet Union, the, the Soviet occupation. And so somehow still it seems to be like for, for many people the, uh, the main focus, okay, uh, this is your like... Uh, trained trademark or this is your market ar article uh, yeah. sell your soviet past please and, mm -hmm. but i i, I think it's uh, like well we have a uh, 
generations of uh, well, we have a whole generation of, uh, of young writers uh, who were born uh, after, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, and yeah. they, uh, of course, it's important to uh, to be aware of, of your history and uh, of this legacy as well. But it's uh, it's it shouldn't be the only thing that you uh, that we are looking for. Sure. Uh, well, can I ask you, just before we open to questions from the audience, which I'd like to do in a moment, I, I want just to ask each of you to, to say something about a, a writer or a book that we haven't got in English that you think we have, because you're talking about um, some of the obstacles of getting certain kind of writers, some of the expectations that books have to do certain things, books have to appeal to some prejudice about the Soviet past, whatever it may be. And I'd be curious to know from each of you, maybe just one book or one writer that you think we should be trying to find a way of bringing into English. One thing that we are, we are still missing from the, the language you read in. Roman, shall I start with, with you at the other Absolutely, end? Absolutely, yeah. Uh, one of my, f well, <laughs> I have so many favorite writers, so when I start saying one of my favorite pick, writers, yeah, it's, pick it's one. Sort of, it becomes almost meaningless. But a writer called Herkus Kuntius, who writes short stories, novels, plays, and so on, and, and essays. So he wrote a novel called, um, well, it won't matter what it's in Lithuanian, because there aren't very many Lithuanians here in the audience, I don't think. But it me, uh, would be, d don't take pity on Dushansky. And Dushansky was, in fact, based on a real character who was a Soviet who uh, came into Lithuania and he climbed the, the ranks of the Communist Party, the hierarchy, became very successful. And then when independence came in 1991, he became nothing. He was a zero. But uh, what Kunshus does in the novel, he takes uh, biblical Lithuanian and he uses that in the speeches of the Communist Party hierarchy. So you have somebody, I mean, it could be, of course, uh, Brezhnev or someone else, who's giving a speech, but he's using, but Kunshus uses biblical Lithuanian. So what I did, because I translated some excerpts, I used uh, a combination of different translations of the Bible, but into modern English, but nevertheless biblical English. Mm. So that was, to me, was a fascinating exercise. I really, really enjoyed that. But then there's a part where Dushansky is on his way to Leningrad, because that's an important city to him, and he feels he needs to see Leningrad in order to grow f even further in the Communist Party hierarchy. So he's in a truck, with, with, with pioneers, you know, young children, youngish children, and they're attacked by partisans, that is, the Lithuanian anti-communist partisans. So it's picaresque. I mean, it actually reminds me of Cervantes. Mm -hmm. And it, it is, it's just, it's a rollicking journey fun, through the Lithuanian way. countryside where he pretends to be the hero. So for example, at one point, he says he takes a boy to his bosom because the boy, after all, is just a boy. He's of no, he'll be, he's of no use to the Communist Party, whereas he, Dushansky, is an important person. So he needs, to, he needs to protect his life in order to give back to the Communist Party. So it's, it, it is the most fantastic novel. When I first read it, I simply loved it, and I would love to translate it. All I've done so far is excerpts, and they've published in an anthology, but I'd love to do all of it. Thank I'm you, that sounds fun. Bribe uh, publisher. What I normally do is I bribe publishers by saying, I'll agree to, pub to translate what you want me to translate, but you agree to, <laughs> to publish, to publish a book you want them to exactly. publish. So I'm working on a publisher right now. Good luck. That's not a good Fingers plan. Cardless, what about you? Dumb I, luck again. I yeah. said, that I said you're, so you've been translated into English, you are published by ARC, I mentioned earlier, but you're one of very few Latvian poets who has a kind of English language publication like that. Who, who are the other poets that we should know about that we're missing? Who, who should we be embarrassed that we have not yet translated? Uh, it's such a hard question because uh, there are uh, several great poets in my generation and there are uh, several great poets before us. Uh, yeah, my, my, I, I love work by Latvian poets. Eric Adamsons, uh, who wrote in the uh, 20s and 30s, and uh, Gunnar Salinch, who was uh, a part of an uh, exile Latvian community in uh, the U United States, uh, a member of uh, Hell's Kitchen poetry group in New York City, 
So yeah, there is a lot of great work. That we have a lot of a lot of catching up we have to yeah. do. Chris, do you have like Roma had a book which he said that is a thing that he wants to translate. Do you have a kind of well, a, a, a top of the wish list book? Uh, I'm the only non-native on the panel, so I have the privilege of constantly discovering new writers that I hadn't known about, and the and, and the Estonians and Latvians have known about for ages. Um, so um, I'm I'm in a position of blissful ignorance most of the time. But I would say that um, from Latvia, as as far as prose writers go. Uh, Inga Abele is, a, uh, I think, a, a great writer, uh, and uh, I, I predict that, that uh, she will soon be available in English. I certainly hope she will be. Um, there, but there are so many fine writers. From, from Estonia, I want to go back into the past because it happens to be a writer I'm translating at the moment who I think is becoming known, the, the great um, Estonian classic Tomsare. And he is um, Anton Hansen, Hansen Tomsare, who would have been 140 this year. Um, and he wrote a great cycle of novels called Truth and Justice, which I'm working on at the moment. So I have a, a biased reason for saying that. But um, uh, he's the one who makes me feel the, the agony of, of past cultural baggage, <laughs> if I may say, put it that way. Thank you, Maria. The same, same question. Do you have like yeah, a magic well, wand? Uh, from the prose writers, uh, I would recommend Anna Michelson. Uh, she died last autumn and uh, she was uh, in her early 70s. And with her, you would have all the historical trauma, all the, uh, the po well, yeah, post Second World War uh, yeah, events. Yeah. Suffering, blood, everything. And what if we don't want it, all the historical uh, trauma? What if we uh, want, you said, all these the great yeah, writers well, uh, kind but of... You, of course, you, the, the events uh, will arrive up to uh, uh, the present day. And uh, what I like about her, uh, she was also a poet, of course. Uh, mm. But I, I like her style, her very hard language and very uh, kind of uh, robust and hard attitudes towards things. So... Uh, uh, this is why I think uh, she would be worth translating, not necessarily for the topic, of course, but uh, then again, uh, yeah, one uh, would have to find a very good translator who, uh, who could have the same uh, sensibility for the style, and then uh, I think it's uh, yeah, not that easy, of course. And then from uh, the poets, uh, I would recommend certainly the poetry of Hasso Krull, who's in uh, his mid-50s now, a very fine poet, uh, accessible enough, uh, strange enough, uh, fine anarchist, I would say, uh, writing on a variety of, of topics and, and, and well, playing with the language uh, and also a kind of a conceptual poet in, in, uh, in certain works. So I think, but also uh, there is the, uh, in, in several uh, works uh, there there is also a specific Estonianness if uh, anybody is interested in, uh, uh, in that. So there is this kind of a, a little exotic flavor, a uh, well, little exotic flavor from the Baltics and also uh, kind of influences from the French symbolism, everything. So I think Hasa Krull and uh, Anna Michelson would be the two authors. So I also got the gender balance, of course, one female, one male author. Well, you, you also, you, so you very modestly didn't say, well, my books should be translated. Oh, well. But, but obviously, oh. that, this, this, <laughs> this is a given, of course, we assume that. But if you had, I mean, do you have a sense of your own work? Of the, is there something in particular? This is a slightly unfair question. But is there something particular that you think, that this you, is, that you really want to be read? a very embarrassing question, I actually well, really... Well, bad uh, luck. There's you, no, you have no choice uh, now. Well, self-promotion. Well, uh, probably my, uh, my documentary novel, my last book, uh, uh, titled uh, The Glass Child, uh, about a woman losing uh, her unborn baby. But also uh, the, the events are set on the, uh, on the backdrop of uh, the political turmoil in Ukraine and, the, and some hot political debates in Estonia. And then uh, some short stories, for example, well, I'm happy that uh, uh, one of these uh, short stories that I would have recommended has already been uh, being translated by like Chris, yeah, about the, uh, the manner culture or the culture of uh, kind of imitating the German nobleman. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, 
there are publishers in the room. Um, we have about 10 minutes left for, for you to ask questions, so I, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to stop now. It's like going to go on strike, cross my arms, and wait for someone else to do some work. Does anyone have any questions for, or any comments for any of our panel, please? I'm going to be brave and ask the first question. We always have this alternative. We, or we can just skip the first question. Would anyone like to ask the second question? Which is much less frightening. We will wait you out. We're very patient. <laughs> Questions? Interesting. Yes, right at the back. Would you just wait for the microphone, please? I'm also trying to speak like three languages. Sorry. Yep, like that. And uh, my question is, how can you do to not to forget or to forget or to forget one of your language? So do you mean how they how they so kind of how they keep their languages? Yeah. Even if they don't use them, so how you keep the languages fresh? Yeah, because I uh, I can speak more or less three languages also. But sometimes I realize that I just keep forgetting some, some stuff in other languages. Yeah. So the question is, if you work between languages, but if you're not, if you're not kind of using the languages from day to day, what do you actually do? Yeah, Ramos. Okay. Right, my answer is very simple. Uh, I wrote a short biography. I was asked to write a, a very short biography, I think 100 words, a, a few months ago. And what I came up was this, that Ramos Kinka, uh, born in Lithuania, came to him at the age of six, but he returns to Lithuania or to his motherland every day by translating Lithuanian authors. So every single day I translate a Lithuanian author or something by a Lithuanian author. Not a single day goes by, not a Monday or a Sunday. Mm. And do you all actually, I mean, do you spend time, I mean, so Chris, do you actually travel to, do you spend time in Estonia, time in Latvia, as a way of keeping those languages alive? Uh, not as much as I'd like, but of course that is, traveling in the countries is the best way of keeping the languages alive. Um, well, I'm in the position where I, um, I teach these languages, so um, I, um, I get a chance to practice my language in a rather artificial way by, by teaching that it's uh, both Estonian and Latvian. Um, but, and since I'm working on translations every day, I, uh, I keep that um, passive knowledge going as well. I don't know if that really answers your question, but that's the best I can think of. <laughs> but, it's, but it's also, as you said, it's a passive thing. It's also you have a different relationship with the language because you're not speaking it, but you're consuming it. I mean, Carla, is that the same for you, that you have the language you translate from? So when you're translating from English, you, do you read English regularly enough that your English is always... It's kind of constantly awake. Uh, now I study in St. Louis, Missouri, so I just have to read. Right, so it's, it's there, though. And presumably, and, and Mario, you, you said at the, at the beginning that you translated from all these different languages, but actually at different times. You used to translate more from, you said, in the past I've done some English and some Russian, and now you do Italian and German. So presumably you're... you're your relationship to those languages changes so you, to do with how comfortable you are, how much you use them. That, that changes over time then. Uh, yeah, certainly does. But uh, I think, uh, first of all, the, uh, the most important thing is, uh, is to work uh, with your mother tongue. You have to be fluent in your mother tongue. Uh, and you, you have to catch the style and, and render it in, in your own language. And uh, then, of course, uh, I, I keep reading, uh, I know to, uh, well, speaking with people who, who are native speakers of, of these languages. In the, uh, it is important, of course, to, uh, to keep these languages al alive, but uh, there are always dictionaries at hand. So it's, uh, like, uh, I think, even more important is the, uh, uh, yeah, well, the... Uh, Kind of mentally grasping what it is about, mm. in the, but of course then they are also like uh, you have to be um, in connection with the culture in order to to understand the attitudes and the the new codes, for example. Mm. You, you might understand everything from the language, but then uh, the, there might still be something that you don't get. Like uh, this is sometimes the case with the uh, 
uh, younger Estonian poets. I mean, even with the Estonian authors, it could be like uh, they are living in a, in a completely different subculture. So you, you have to kind of uh, you have to learn about it. But also they, they, they change over time, don't they? Yeah, Every yeah, language, yeah, the language, sure. whether it's yeah. a language you're uh, translating from, mm -hmm. is different yeah, 20 like, uh, years from first, now. Yeah, yeah, when I, uh, for example, we, when I had this uh, yeah, well, yeah, Italian boyfriend then I, and I was living in Italy, then I was translating more from the Italian. And uh, at the moment, of course, I'm, uh, I'm not translating that much anymore. I'm uh, writing my own stuff, and this is uh, this was also something that I wanted to say that we we are really very lucky to have these good translators who want to remain translators, who don't start to uh, to write themselves, because sometimes it may happen that we we just lose very good translators because uh, they become in ambitious enough, they become authors. <laughs> <laughs> so they, they they use translation as a way of. Yeah, practicing yeah, yeah. and making I a bit of money. This, this, this is what happened to me. <laughs> I'm a bad example about that. So you were such a promising translator, and then you betrayed us. <laughs> Shame on you. <laughs> Romas is still one of us. Well, one, we one, like him. One sentence. Yes, one sentence. Apropos of what Chris just said, he used the word passive of translation. I don't consider <laughs> translating a passive activity. I consider it to be very much an active one because in translating an author, I enter into a dialogue with that author. Right. So for me, it's, it is very much active. But your relationship with the language you're translating from and the language you're translating to have very different dynamics. And I think that's one of the things that Chris was talking about, having a relationship with the, uh, if you want to call it the source language, where you don't have to be able to produce yeah. it, but you have to be a sensitive yeah. reader of this Absolutely. thing. A translation exists separately from the original. <laughs> the original is the original. There can be seven translations, ten translations. It doesn't matter. But the original goes on existing forever and a day. Yeah. Unless it's, of course, pulped by uh, a de an autocratic regime or burned. But even yeah. then, it will go on existing. Right. Mm. Well, thank you all very much. I'm sorry to say we are now out of time. Thank you for coming. Uh, do please join me in thanking uh, Maria and Chris and Carlos and Ramos. Thank you.